Well, once again, it's so good to be with you. Um, where that we have a few folk here tonight that were not with us this morning. So just briefly, I'll say uh, we are very thankful to be a part of the work of Bible translation. Bibles International is the Bible Society of Baptist Mid-Missions. And we have been in existence as an uh, agency, Baptist Mid-Missions, for over 100 years. Uh, Mid-Missions refers to the same heart that uh, folk like um, Hudson Taylor and many others have, have shared to go where the gospel had not been preached and Christ had not been named. And typically through a lot of history, you have missionaries that were able to get to the edges of areas, but the interior of countries uh, has been that unreached zone in so many places at so many times. And so whether it was China or the middle of Africa for our uh, founder, Baptist Mid-Missions, uh, William Haas, and then so many others uh, would take, and we call these folk pioneers as missionaries, pioneering, church planting missionaries, where they're going out into totally uncharted lands in terms of the gospel being given there. And some of them also charted even the atlas, so to speak, the maps. Um, these people, as God gave them the abilities to, uh, first of all, survive and then relate to the people apart from verbal language and then through much work and time learn their languages to better and better degrees, shared the gospel with them, had to learn their their personal worldviews of these peoples that God had called them to reach. As you have heard in various occasions, um, all of this is part of the task that we are called to do as God's people, and especially when you go to a foreign land. But we're called living here to understand uh, where the people are that God is calling us to reach. So it's, it's all part of his work because he wants his image bearers to get his love. He wants us to understand. He wants us to receive his truth by faith in our hearts and be changed. So in that big picture, Bible translation is an is a indispensable foundation. Um, it's not the whole house. The whole house is this people of God brought together to him and in heart made more and more like the Lord Jesus, being filled with his love, his truth, his righteousness, being brought into conformity to him. So we're thrilled that we get to be this part um, to, to carry out a role in the Great Commission as Bible translation uh, missionaries. I want to take us on a little journey this evening, though, in understanding the ministry of Bible translation, having that, you know, big picture, this is where we are in the big picture, um, having that introduction. I want us to look a little more at now the inner parts of the Bible translation ministry, not, again, trying to get super technical tonight, but I do want to look, first of all, at just a few passages of Scripture, and I don't even think you need to turn to them. We will, I'll read them, and I want you to note in, in your mind, as we read them, what we're seeing here about both need for the scriptures, for God's word, and the heart language of the people, as well as what God does to meet the needs. Okay? Now, the first passage I want to read is, is getting right down to the very essential. And you'll, I'll read it, and then you'll, you'll see what I mean. This is in... The last main recorded address we have from King David before the Lord 
brought him to be with himself. At the end of 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the second verse, David says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was on my tongue. Okay, now that encapsulates a, a, an amazing divine truth of God's love for us, of God's condescension to us. God doesn't have any internal need for any of us or to reach out to any of us or to use our language to do it. He could demand that we learn the language of angels. You know, Paul talks about the language of angels there in the beginning of what we call the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. But no, he has come seeking us and it's by his word. Now, I want to share another passage. Consider what we should learn uh, from this passage. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest, that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Now, if you can't, perchance, actually put in your mind the actual number year that this was and the place on the dot on the map of Israel, if you can't quite do that, don't worry, you're in good company, that's just about all of us, okay? Um, but realize, this is God speaking to Jeremiah and giving him this message for his people at this place, at this point in time in history, right when this word was needed. And it even tells when it when this giving of the word and when the message was to be given to them, the period of time for it, till the end point when uh, there was the carrying away, captivity to Babylon. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, I formed thee in the belly before I knew... I formed thee... Let me start again. Every word. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet under the nations. Here we see how God gives his word um, in history, not in a mechanical fashion. There's what's called a, a theory of dictation. God giving his word basically to a typist or to a, a, someone who simply had this audible and wrote out words. But we, we see here that God, even informing Jeremiah from before and involving his personality, just as we see with how other writers in the scriptures wrote and the, dis, the differences of how they wrote, um, God involved the men. He breathed through the men. And he did it in such a way that we have both the fullness of God's word and it's at the same time fully human. Um, there's nothing there that's not human. It's not that the writers always understood all the all of what they wrote and all of the implications, especially, of what they wrote. Um, we have very clear testimony in a number of places that it was hidden from the prophet when he spoke what, what this was actually going to play out to. But anyway, I'm, I'm wanting to give this foundation in the nature of the scriptures themselves and the process of what we call inspiration so that that's the proper background, and, and again, a lot of us have had good teaching from this. I, I don't know when the last time a pastor had a, had a sermon or a Sunday school series in this, but um, it's important that, that this is part of 
what we understand when we look at Bible translation. The next passage, it's a little bit longer. I won't even read all of it. This is when, though, God brought a remnant back from Babylon. And there were actually a few different groups that came. And with one of the groups, you had Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's said of Ezra that he was a scribe in the law of the Lord. He was, he was very much uh, a student, but not just academically. Because he had set his heart not only to learn and to teach, but it was to do. It was to do what God had commanded. And it's, it's, uh, this passage is in uh, Nehemiah 8. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. Now, don't picture this and him standing on top of the pulpit. This is not, you know, shouting, um, so to speak. Uh, it's, it's a wooden platform. It's more like this. This is the pulpit, so to speak. So everybody could see and, and frankly, to hear. They didn't have the PA system. Um, so he was going to read out loud from the law of the Lord. And he did so early in the morning until, now I lost my place, until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. He opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. And then it gives a list of, uh, what, about 16 men, 15, 16 men, who then, after he had read from the book of the law, this is the law of Moses, it's in the Hebrew language, he's reading it to a people who have spent up to 70 years in Babylon, hearing, speaking Aramaic. He then has these men out among them, and probably the way the text puts it, it's not after he reads, it's not just after, it's even during. And they are helping the people understand the message. They are translating, and they are also doing even some more in a sense of, of teaching. It's not maybe the, the most strict example of translation that we see uh, depicted in the scripture, although it's close. It's, it would be interpreting and explaining, a combination of it during this instance. Why was it needed? Again, the law of Moses is in what language? Hebrew, it's in Hebrew, and what had they been in the midst of for seven decades? Aramaic. Did you know that there's certain portions, not very much, but certain portions of the Old Testament in Aramaic? And I'll let you guess which ones those are. They're the ones that God gave to his people after they returned from the exile. It's because God wants us to get it. He wants us to know him and walk with him. It wasn't to give seminary students an even harder time who thought they had it bad enough to learn Hebrew. It is a lot of work. but um, So this is some background uh, from the scriptures, God speaking to us so that our hearts will receive. That has to come through hearing and understanding in our human language. Let me give you another, I'll, I'll call it a heads up. If you've gone on a mission trip, you've seen this, and you may be somewhat aware of it. Actually, people in America are more aware of it now than they used to be. Um, several decades ago, you could grow up in America and almost 
your entire growing up years and a lot of your adult years, how many languages were you hearing and speaking? Uno. <laughs> Sorry. One. Yes. That's very unusual in most of the world today. We're in quite the minority. And even through history, peoples were more segregated out and would tend to speak just one language until the next kingdom had come over and invaded and then it was all shuffled up. It's part of why we have so many languages today. Um, over 7,000 languages in the world. But I, I say this, there's a lot of things that people in churches in America have believed about Bible translation because we haven't had the kind of exposure that people who've grown up with two languages or three or four, sometimes even more, do every day going from one to the other and seeing, oh, this language is different, not only in the words it's choosing for this same object and this same activity, but even in how the vocab intersect, I'll call it, because it's not one-to-one, -one. and it's not even two-to-two, -two. like this word covers two meanings, and then the word from this language covers the same two meanings, and how well exactly do they fit, it's more like, you know, this word has this, so these two are lining up really well, you know, the, this language and this language, and this one it touches, and this one's not doing so well. And then there's this other one out here, I forgot. And this word in this language does mean this in some contexts, and you cannot use this word in the other language to translate it and be accurate. Okay? That's the vocabulary scene between languages, um, just generally speaking, in a nutshell, big nutshell, or a lot in a little nutshell. Um, and then there's these principles of how words are used together in each language, and guess what? The principles are not the same from language to language either. So basically what we have when we come to Bible translation or any translation, um, the term, there, there is a, let me put it this way, there is a good, accurate, important use of the phrase word-for-word -word translation. It's very important, it's very right, when it's understood correctly. And then there's been a lot of misunderstanding of it too. Um, in certain senses that that phrase has been understood, I can say without fear, there is no such thing as word for word translation. It's not the same as translation. Now, in some other very important ways, it's a good phrase. We want to keep it, we want to understand it biblically. How is this important? And this is very important when we train our, our translators, those that we look, um, and I'll talk a little more about the process, but those that basically the churches in this language group, as they look out prayerfully and they see, this is whom God is calling, these two people, these two pastors many times, not always, um, are those that God is calling to be our translators in this project. Um, when we train them in terms of philosophy of translation and even in linguistics, um, we have to be understanding the nature of language itself, human language, which is how God has communicated to us, So let me come back now to what, what do we mean and what do we need to understand when we hear word for word, or another way to put it is literal, and there should be an important qualifier there, essentially literal, translation. Okay? What you have is this. God used these languages, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, some, to communicate 
And he, uh, these languages are expressed in the words. Okay? Languages are expressed in words between personal beings. We won't count the parrots. That's not quite the same. Okay? Verbal. Doesn't have to be oral, but verbal. We're talking about words, either written, heard, spoken, between people, between personal beings, including God, the eternal person. Communication, then, is, as one book puts it, and it puts it well, from the mind of God to the mind of man, and don't exclude the heart from that, the mind in its fullest sense, including the emotions, using human language. How does that language come out? It's the words that we have in the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. But we have to realize those languages are using the words with different principles. Each one has its own set of how the people who lived then that God was speaking to in those days, how those people were using those words in relation to one another in phrases and sentences and paragraphs. And those rules, what, the, the thing that most often comes up that we can recognize most easily is word order. The word order in English and and Greek or Hebrew is not the same. If you get a, a first semester Greek student and he gets his 75 words Hebrew or, or Greek vocab words or 200 words and he's ready to go to his first verses and he puts the words down from all the Greek that he sees and he puts them down in English. If he puts them down in the same order, it's not going to make a lot of sense in English. You'll probably be able to figure out most of it, but it's not the same word order. Okay, that's the easiest example to, to understand and see of languages having different ways of arranging the words. Even forming the words, we have different rules. We talk about friendly, friendlier, friendliest. Okay, we know how to do that, right? We er, est, that's how we get our comparison comparisons. There's lots of ways that we modify our words like this. Okay, other languages, you don't add an er and an est. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, all of this to say we have, um, we have to take that into account in translation. What's critical is that we take the time, the prayer, the consultation, when you look at the translations, the original languages, the commentaries, others alive as well, praying, listening to God, what he has said in his word, by those words, and receive as much as we can the full message of what he said by those words. Take that and by his grace, preserving that message, Put it into the language, not just, not just the words, words of themselves, but into the full expression of words in the natural flow of the words of that target language. In order to do that, we partner with the believers in those nations, those languages, because they've lived there. They've lived that language. It is their heart language. It's not mine. There are some gifted, and I even heard of one or two um, when I was visiting after church, uh, who are so gifted they can take a decade, live among a people, not only learn their language just as well or better than most of the people there, and then begin translating the scripture. That's great. The way we do it... Um, we're partnering using languages that they already know and we already know to work and check back and forth to get the scriptures translated into those languages where a lot of times it's, 
um, how can I say, more linguistically remote. Uh, example, what do I mean by that? For our family to learn German together would be a lot of work. Okay? If we were to learn German, that would be a lot of work. However, German is an Indo-European language. And frankly, there's a lot of similarity as linguists compare languages. There's a lot of similarity between German and English. It's even more work, and it's not like it's the hardest, but it is even more work, though, for our family, English speaking, with Spanish, which helps that we've been thinking in two languages somewhat. We don't do a lot of Spanish, but we do. Um, but for our family, then, to learn Thai, that's more work than it would be to learn German because of where the, the languages are. Particularly, one features with tonality of Thai. They have different pitches, relative pitches, not exact piano pitches, but um, in their flow of their sentences, the word pitch goes up and down. And if you say a different pitch and a same syllable, that can be a different word than if you were to say it at the low end of the five pitch. So again, all of that, I say just to give you a little more view of the languages that God has ordained um, where we are. Now, <clears throat> let me just say at this point, pray for us. Okay, God gives gifts and he gives grace. We always need God's grace to carry out the mission that he, he has called each one of us to. As we face our enemy, as we push forward in God's kingdom, there's more hostility. And we do feel it in Bible translation work, very much so. So please be praying very much for us. Our goal in all of this is something it's hard to express in words. Um, I've not yet gotten to be at a celebration when a people group is receiving for the first time in history the word of God in their language. I've seen a few video clips, and I've heard some testimonies, and I have imagined. Um, you think about the, the joyous shouting, and at least for those who are able, many times the leaping, the clutching of the Bible to the heart, and then the devotion to that book that is unlike any other book. It's the book from heaven, the devouring of it. And for those who couldn't read and wouldn't have even thought about reading, maybe didn't even know about reading, maybe didn't even have a written language, people in their 50s, their 60s, even 70s, giving it their, their heart to try to learn this thing reading so that they can better take in God's word. We also are very thankful that God is helping us to grow in our audio Bible uh, aspect because it is in the life circumstances of many of God's people it is going to be so much harder for them to take in God's word through reading, even when they've had opportunity to get the training and after they've had the translation into their language. That hearing is so natural, it's so free, and when you can give them a little device that has the New Testament on it, and they can take it out into their field or into their kitchen and listen, what a gift. 
It's good for there to be the readers as well. That's so important for study, especially for pastors and teachers. And, and you know, reading is so good. I, I, I'm not here to convince you of that. or, But so we work with them as well in that area. Now, if I can just for a moment give you a little better snapshot of this, we'll call it a community that God helps us in each language group form uh, this project team, also I could say, within the believers um, in order to make a Bible translation by God's grace come together. First of all, as I emphasized this morning, it is the local churches, it is the, the believers in each people group that we are partnering with as best we can you know, sadly, just like here in America, at times, there are divisions among Christians worldwide. Sorry to disappoint you. Although, I'll say, there's not nearly, nearly so much worldwide, percentage-wise, per capita, per church building, as you would see here. Um, but there's still, nonetheless, there's those issues that we do have to work through. However, when we partner with these peoples, these groups of local churches, we, we have a lot to do fundamentally uh, at the beginning of a project, that is, to help them come together in this community. They are praying. They are seeking out those God's already been using among them. Um, God's already given gifts, both uh, language-wise and ministry and time in the word um, an important part, as I mentioned earlier, was that those who would translate also need to have a good uh, working knowledge and understanding of a bridge language. What do I mean by bridge language? That's the language that a consultant from Bibles International is going to converse with them. I'm going to work with them in English. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to say, Groups that know Thai, but they don't know English, will be able to work with them in. Um, our consultants also have about seven or eight other languages um, between different ones that we can work with these people groups in. So that's a bridge language, and the translators especially need to, to have that down pretty well and be able to continue improving in those languages so that we can work efficiently together. Now, um, there are two translators, hopefully. Sometimes there's even three or four. We, we hope for two. If there's more and it's a good situation, that's great. Um, sometimes there are just one. Each project differs. Another key part of the Bible translation project group community is what we call the sponsorship committee, or you can think of it as the oversight committee. These mostly are pastors, pastors of the churches involved who will then be kind of the go-betweens, the local churches and the translators, the read and review committees, um, so that the churches are up to date on the project. They're praying for the Bible translation project. That's so important in so many ways, not just for the translators to be able to do the work, but also that the churches would be ready to receive the translation when it comes. It is basically inevitable that there will be someone voice opposition to just about any new Bible translation that comes out. Um, we are very thankful, though, at Bibles International that more and more we have seen through the years, God bless, ways of preparing and praying and making these connections so um, valued in the community of faith in these language groups that that has greatly been minimized. Um, it does still happen sometimes. But uh, we've, we've seen a lot of unity the, the Lord has given through the years. And uh, so we're very thankful. 
so that's the sponsorship committee. They are, they are uh, making sure that the churches and the translation team are working together, including that the churches are providing for the translators to give themselves as much as they can to the translation work. Um, if there's a people group that is very hard off economically, Bibles International will help with providing for the translators, but we still want the churches to be encouraged to do what they can so that again, this is their project, it really is. This is not our project, it's not our Bible translation primarily. We are getting to partner with them in this work that is God's call for his people to hear him, to trust him, to obey him here in this age. The last part of the, of the team is a group that once the translation of a section has been made, they'll receive it. And they're basically listening to help the uh, translators catch anything that really didn't sound like good Aka or Falam Chin, whichever language it is. They're listening for a naturalness or something that was not clear in what it meant. You know, the translators are trying to catch this as they go, but for them to have another set of ears, and typically these are, are folk that are among the more educated, more well-read in this uh, people group, and they don't get the ultimate say in what comes out in the translation, but it is another sounding board for the translators to go back and check and then for us to come together and prayerfully seek, okay, this is what is the best way to say what God said in the original in this language, and it to be clear, understandable, faithful for these people. Let me just list for you the qualities and say a little bit about each one that we are seeking in the translation, and you'll, you'll hear that basically I have covered this already. Oh, good. I still have a little bit of time. Okay. The four qualities, and, and you can split this up different ways, and, but this is pretty well refined. Uh, number one is faithfulness. We are relating, by God's grace, what he said, not leaving out, not adding to, but what God said. We want to be faithful, precisely faithful to the original text, the original message. Number two, I've already said it several times, we want this in the translation to sound like people are talking day in and out, not vulgar, you know, not, not any sinful way, but just the, the good English, good Akka, good whatever language, um, in terms of its grammar, its syntax, its readability, its good oral um, retention. You hear it and you don't say, what did he mean by that? Um, it's it's going to be natural. Clarity in some ways is related to that, but here we mean when, when, a, when a discerning hearer or reader reads a statement, we don't want them to look at that and say, well, this could mean this, or it could mean this. We don't want, by how we translate, there to be these ambiguities where God has given a clear word. Um, so that there's this sense of clarity. We want it to be clear. The other aspect that we want our translations to have, we want them to be readable. And by readable, I'm referring to the, the level of language. Um, the Bible actually does, in its original languages, vary in this. Generally, for, for most of the time, you have narratives. The Bible is so much 
nor, uh, narratives, stories. And these stories are understandable by young ones. You do get into material that's a bit more stout intellectually and needs to be, um, well, and I should clarify here also though, there's a depth of thought of what the Bible expresses. These are deep things, deep truths. But how we say, how we communicate those, those thoughts, the language that we use, we can be either more simple or we can be more complex in our expression. So um, we want to follow the Bible's level of readability. Um, most of the time, the Bible has a fairly low level in terms of it being very readable even by young ones. Um, there are times when it gets up a bit more. Um, the most elevated language in the scripture probably over Old Testament or New is when Paul is stand, standing before Mars Hill. Um, this was the philosophical summit of the ancient world at that time, and the Greeks were known for it particularly. And so he stands there and he gives praise to God, who is the creator of all, the sustainer, the unknown God to them, and goes on to explain how God, though, is not unknown because he's not near. That's not the reason, and it's not because he's not seeking. It's, it's more that we need to look to the waywardness of our own hearts and points them to the one that God sent and even that he raised him from the dead and then at that point they're whoa but in that whole uh, discourse that Paul had with them that was very uh, elevated speech um, Greek students don't get to that in their first two or three years typically <laughs> it's it's pretty tough working through so um, but that's the exception. Yeah, and there's other places that are you know, harder, but not that hard. But most of the time, we want, again, we want our, our translations to very clearly um, speak to even young people. I try to do that too, but sometimes I have a hard time with that. Um, I'm working on it, and I get some good help, even at home. And it's a good thing. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground. I could say more. But I probably better stop and take some questions. And maybe I ought to do it after I have everybody stand up for a minute. If you want to, you're welcome to stand. I don't think I put anybody to sleep, actually. Maybe close. If I can come back, though, to the heart of what we shared. Yes, you may be seated. I know it, it's, it's painful when someone's supposed to be speaking to stand for more than like 26 seconds. It's probably less. Um, to the heart of our, our ministry that we shared this morning, um, what we are looking for is the kind of joy, the kind of life-changing power that we know is behind someone looking at us and saying, this is amazing. Now God speaks my language. There have been many times throughout our history as an organization when that Bible comes to them and we hear that. I'm looking forward to hearing it with my own ears. I'm not there yet. But I'm thankful that the Lord has helped us to be part of it. Part of the work already in my, as I'm being mentored along in the organization. Now, um, I told you that I would give you a few minutes for questions, and uh, so I better do that. And uh, who will be first? Yes, sir.
Yes, Thailand is a, it is a kingdom right now without a king officially. He, they had a really good one in terms of what people hope to have in, in a king um, that died several years ago. And, uh, but yeah, as far as the gospel is concerned, they, as a nation, because of their dependence in their economy on tourism, which has really hurt over the last couple of years, they have to look internationally friendly. Um, because of that, they have a set number of missionary visas. Um, it's like 830 something. They don't add to it. Uh, they do allow some not-for-profit organization visas, and so there's actually a lot of Christians who are doing work in Thailand under that uh, umbrella and providing both humanitarian aid but also sharing the gospel. Um, but there is that openness in Thailand, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, it comes with some costs, and it doesn't come without, in certain areas, us knowing they really would rather us not be there doing what we're doing. Um, but we're thankful for the open door. Now, as far as personally, there are certainly a lot of things that keep ties back in their hearts. Fear, um, there's lots of things that would keep them back from responding to a gospel invitation. That's not easy ground to work. Yes, ma'am. Well, if you just talk about being on the ground there versus on the ground here, overall, it's probably a little less expensive. Most things are less expensive. Cars are a good bit more expensive. So especially up front, it's going to be heavier um, once we get a vehicle and such. Anyway, um, there is extra expense, though, with having a family who is from here. 12 hours, 12 time zones away. I mean, it's literally on the other side of the world. Um, so that, overall, it's, uh, you know, our support level, I, I mentioned, we're over a third. We're a little over 40% right now at our support level. But we have a total that we're looking at somewhere over $6,000 a month. That still needs to be nailed down better since our survey trip um, and the data we've collected since then and that we're landing now in Chiang Mai and not Bangkok. That does help, for sure, not living in Bangkok. Yes, sir. Jesus' parables. That's quite the, the set of info. Um, well, clearly, if you're referring to the, the cultures being different, um, yeah, you've got a lot of agriculture that, frankly, we have to, many times in America, there's lots of places, uh, city slickers, that we don't understand a lot of that and have to get the teaching. And, and frankly, the answer is um, that's more the pastor and teacher's role to teach what some of these things were, and yet we would still seek to translate as literally for most things. It, it's not a simple thing. We have a, I have a consultant's manual that's about 200 pages long that's our particular condensation of the ins and outs of Bibles International, Bible con, of, of translation consulting, and lots of different ways we handle different phenomena in the text, these difficult you know, idioms are some of the hardest things to deal with between languages. Um, and, and so there's, it's not a simple answer. But uh, yeah, typically you are leaning toward the literal translation unless it does not make sense. And then as things, there's a lot of opportunity to teach after the translation comes out. Sometimes a note is very helpful in the text, or, or under the text, I should say, but in the scripture, uh, the printed volume. 
Does that help? I know it, you asked a broad question, I gave a broad answer, so hopefully that's not too disappointing. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, the Thai language um, has a way of denoting those in their script. It's a whole other script. It's not our Latin alphabet. So we actually have not learned hardly any Thai so far. We did a little bit on our survey trip. And um, so we'll be getting into that, and I'll be able to tell you about it later if, if uh, the Lord appoints that time to you can ask me then. But they do have ways, and I've, I've seen it pointed out, some markings that show that pitch. Also, frankly, most written languages that have tonal, you don't have to write all of the pitches and all of the accent marks because the writing is noting to us as speakers what the communicator intends. And we have all the life situation of how this language goes we don't have to have every last little accent and tone marked for us to get from the context what it is saying. Um, so a lot of languages do that, where it's, and it's, it's the most efficient way, and that's, that's just really what we do. Frankly, we, it's not the same, it's the same principle in English. English does this same kind of thing, obviously not with tones, um, but in ways we spell and things we leave off. Um, different, well, I could get real technical, but anyway, yes. Someone else? Sorry, I'm not seeing the hand. Aha, all the way over. Yes, sir. So uh, when you get there, is there like a time frame maybe once they learn all the Thai like five or eight classes? Could be like 10, 15, 20 years, and then from there you can work on other languages that may speak the Thai? Very good question. Thank you for asking something that I would love to have already said, but that's why you're asking, right? Okay. Um, when we get there, we will be focusing on learning the Thai language. The Thai already have a couple translations of the scripture. Uh, we have already been involved in a few different of our organization's translation projects. We certainly want to be focusing more in on the Akka Bible translation because they are in Thailand, near to where we will be living. Um, but once I get to be a full-time Bible translation consultant and we're done with the, you know, the mentorship process and the language learning for Thai, um, typically we don't just handle one project at a time, it's two or three. Um, so it would likely be either another project in Thailand, if, if another one comes about by then, or one of the dozen projects that we have in Myanmar. We have another dozen in the next country over to the west. Um, so there's lots of work that we're trying to keep moving forward. Um, as far as how long it would take, we've started into the Old Testament with the Akka. They've got a very good team, more efficient than most of our teams probably is going to take another decade to finish the Old Testament with them, maybe a little more than a decade, we'll see. Um, but it can, it can take longer, you know, depending on who God has given in that, in that group. Anybody else? And remember also, if you, don't, if you think of something later, you can come back to the table or email me. I've got that on my prayer card. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we do not typically get into producing tracks. Um, we seek to uh, make sure that the, you know, a lot of times, because these folk are already believers, there is something that they're being able to use. Most of them, yeah, most of them, a lot of them, have a second or third language Bible where at least, the, uh, I say at least, not always, a lot of times, the pastor is able to deal with well enough, he's getting fed and he's being able to feed. It's not always the case, but 
Um, there are some resources, but they are also very needy. In terms of what we try to do alongside of our translation, many times there's a need for, for people to be learning to read and learning to teach reading. So we will produce our linguistics department will produce materials along that line. And those many times, once we get past a pre-primer for reading, they'll get into um, Old Testament storybooks is what we call them. And we try to include there all of the Old Testament content that is what we would call critical for understanding the, the body of New Testament truth. Now, obviously, you want the whole Old Testament for the New Testament, but uh, you can't do that first. So that's what we do in terms of helping them that way as well. But no, our organization's not historically, and I think because of the importance, the fundamental importance of scriptures, uh, we do focus in, that's what we can do, and that's helping them to be able to do these other things. Anyone else? We probably should, it's probably about that time. So, Pastor, would you like to come up and, and close, and then uh, please feel free to catch us. Please also do, if you have not already, uh, swing by and take a prayer card, pray for us. Put your name down if you would. Uh, we would love for you to uh, get our email letter. I will not take that if you put your name down as a promise that you are going to read every line and you're going to always pray for us. We'll take all the prayer we can get, just as the Lord leads you. Thank you so much for having us. That help? I, I want you to put it in this light. That same process was, was followed to put the Bible that you're holding in your lap. We're, we're thinking about, you know, Ty and Akka, but, but the, that's the kind of work that it took so you could read the Bible in the English language. We don't think about that. But as he was talking in such details and the, the technicalities of bringing from one from an original language to, uh, to my language, it dawned on me that's the process that somebody went through so Mark Campbell could read the Bible in his first language. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to use a Spanish Bible because I recognize the letters, but I don't recognize 99.9% .9 of those words. Um, and I would hate to have to use a second or third language. Um, but I, I really appreciated that tonight. And I hope that helps you, church. I, I hope that helps us in our appreciation of the word of God that we get to hold in our hands and, uh, and read. And, and there's not a person in the world in any people group or in any language or dialect that deserves any less than me getting to read it in my language. There's not anyone that deserves any less of that. So uh, praise the Lord for that. I encourage you to go by their table, please. Uh, please pick up one of their prayer cards, if you would. And um, it's got a lot of information on the back. And uh, I, I, know that, uh, I know that that's an interesting topic. It's a, it's a unique topic for us to get to. And I hope today's been profitable to you in, in understanding all of that. Um, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Amber leaves tomorrow night, so you won't see her again unless you bump into her at Walmart tomorrow. Uh, but get by and tell her goodbye tonight, if you would, all right? Let's stand together. Dr. Manley, would you, would you be the one to dismiss us in prayer tonight? Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.